Good evening. Trust you've been enjoying this nice week we've had. It's been a lovely time, at least outdoors, and uh, and uh, the Lord certainly refreshed us in this little time of uh, refreshment of fall weather before the other stuff comes. And uh, thank you again for those who have been praying, uh, those who uh, came Sunday, many expressed an enjoyment of the time together, which is expected, which is uh, refreshing uh, as well. Well, we'll continue in our Bible study uh, tonight uh, as we uh, have been looking at the commands really given to continually uh, be in fellowship. And it's stated in the negative, and uh, we looked at that already, that we would uh, not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. And uh, we know that that, uh, that, uh, that exhortation is what it is there is given to us, uh, that we might not draw back or drop out is what we've been considering. And, uh, and, and as a result of that, we've been looking in the Word of God and saying, what does God's Word have to say about the church coming together? And uh, barring the pandemic, and the pandemic, by the way, only challenges us to be more creative and biblical in our approach to fellowship. Uh, lest we think that biblical fellowship is only taking place here for an hour on Sunday morning. Now, it's great to come here on Sunday morning. Each week, it seems we've had some new ones coming. And uh, for those of us that have been coming right along, it certainly... Uh, it feels comfortable. It, it's uh, been good and uh, refreshing to us spiritually. But lest we think that that the fellowship that the scriptures talk about is limited to an hour of worship on a Sunday, uh, we really miss the significance, the strength of the doctrine of fellowship for the believer. And uh, so we want to think in broader terms uh, than we would think normally. And as a matter of fact, it, it, it becomes quite difficult for the Christian to think biblically if we consider that fellowship takes place in one hour during a week. That is not, that is not what we see in the New Testament. And that's why I'm taking us uh, to look at the scriptures uh, biblically from the New Testament and, and ask ourselves, uh, why should believers gather? Why did they gather? And, and when they gather, what did they do? And uh, what was the essence of it, the spirit of it? And when we understand that, we realize and recognize that fellowship of God's people is a seven-day-a-week affair. Now, yes, on the seventh day, or the first day of the week, uh, the believers came together to worship the Lord, which is uh, rightly so biblical. But it wasn't limited to that. And so lest we be discouraged, uh, if you're uh, maybe saying, you know, I, I, I wasn't in church Sunday, or I don't, I'm not going to my church on Sunday, uh, I'm not comfortable with doing that right now, I, I think it's better that I stay home. I was just talking with someone in the past hour, and I said, it probably is wise for them to stay home. There are times and exceptions where that needs to be the case uh, during a time like this. But the question to be answered is, the staying home from a church service remove me or remove you from fellowship in the name of Jesus Christ. I submit to you that fellowship, again, is broader than, than that. Yes, it includes our worship together. And, and, and if we can, we ought to. Uh, but it certainly involves more than that. And I think our study uh, tonight will uh, bring us to address that. The exhortation. Forsake not the assembling. It's, it's, uh, it's a necessary, it's a, a must for the believer. And, and the language in Hebrews that we've been looking at, uh, the language in Hebrews 10 is to do so in a continual fashion. Continue to be in fellowship. Can keep on keeping yourself in fellowship. That is the essence of the teaching in Hebrews 10. Now, in this study of answering the question, why should believers gather together? Uh, we looked at a number of things already. I'll just review those quickly with you. Uh, the first one we noticed was we, we meet together that we might observe the Lord's commandment uh, to keep the Lord's table and to baptize men. 
the very fact that we're to celebrate the communion service to observe it regularly uh, dictates that we come together regularly to do such a thing as this. It's when we come together that we're to do that. It's, it's, it's in its essence. It is, uh, it is an uh, ordinance given to the church at large. A church uh, statement of faith uh, constitution recognizes that and underscores it as well. The second reason, not only to come together to absorb the Lord's table, but we look secondly at the fact that it's a time when we come together, it's to be a time of teaching and preaching God's Word. And up until these recent days, uh, we've had a good, steady diet of teaching and preaching God's Word. Uh, that teaching and preaching that, that can reach down into the children's ministries, and it has, into our youth ministries, into our Sunday morning and, of course, our Sunday night services where uh, some of our deacons have uh, taken and taught regularly from the Word of God, uh, directly teaching uh, chapter by chapter through the Bible. And so we've had that steady, regular diet of teaching, which is what the church is to do when we gather together in that way. And uh, uh, we want to look, we want to notice that. We looked at the fact that when, when, Barnabas and Paul, Saul then, first went to Antioch, where there were new believers. Uh, we looked uh, well at the fact that uh, when they got there, they stayed in the church a whole year, and they taught them the Word of God. And uh, that's one thing that Christians need, is to be in God's Word, instructed, yes, by men, but indeed by the Holy Spirit. We get that daily as we read God's Word, and the Holy Spirit works in us. He's the one who teaches us the Scripture, whether or not we're at home in a chair, reading the Scriptures at a table, uh, looking over the Scriptures, or we're sitting here uh, at the church building. It's always the Holy Spirit who teaches us the things that we would not know otherwise. As a matter of fact, you can have great teaching from the pulpit, but if the Holy Spirit's not at work in your life, there will be little learning to glean. So we want to recognize the Holy Spirit's work in, in our midst as we come together in the teaching and preaching ministry. <clears throat> we, we stopped last time on the fact that we gather for prayer. We gather for prayer. We, we mentioned earlier, Jesus said in Matthew 21, 13, uh, it is written, Jesus said it to the Jews of his day, my house shall be called a house of prayer prayer. Although we're New Testament saints, I don't think that's, uh, that's far away from where the church ought to be. God's people have always been characterized as a people who pray. That's how we communicate, isn't it? To God the Father. I was uh, really astir as I looked into the scriptures for our reading last weekend from the dwell re reading. And we're at the end of a week of study and, and looking back in the Old Testament that at how uh, God crowned Joshua the priest with his own grace and his own glory. He put a crown on his head as well as clothing on his body, clothing of righteousness, that he might serve him. And in the midst of all his failures, the Holy Spirit, God himself, took full ownership and declared it such that he was indeed God's man for the hour. And uh, you and I may not feel very qualified when we look at ourselves. But we need not look any further than to the grace of God than to recognize the fact that God has His hand on us and His plan for our lives in spite of what we might think would hinder Him from doing so. We'll come back to that, Lord willing, some on Sunday in our study of Ephesians 1. Uh, but here in the reading last weekend, we were... Brought in chapter 2, uh, Acts chapter 2 that is, if you'd like to turn there with me uh, tonight. Acts chapter 2, uh, we read in the reading uh, last Saturday morning, or whenever you might be reading the dwell if you had have opportunity to. We read there in chapter 2, it's the day of Pentecost when many were saved. And, and, and we read these, uh, read these words here as uh, we look at 2 and verse 42 of Acts. 
speaking about the believers and the new believers added to the original uh, members of the congregation. It says, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly. That's similar to the language in our study in Hebrews chapter 10 that we looked at earlier. They continued steadfastly. That's a powerful phrase, really. It's a strong uh, term. It means to persist obstinately. Some of us are watching the election still and, and the results and the, re the resulting uh, days. And uh, some are persistent of one thing and others are insistent upon others. These believers were uh, continually steadfast. They were persistent in the Apostles' Doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread. That was the uh, communion service itself and in prayers. That's the point I'm trying to get to here. That's what they did. They, they continued in the area of prayer. Who did? The early believers, those who were Jesus, yes, they did. And so did the 3,000 new people, thereabouts, that were just saved. Can you imagine today if someone gets saved and we said, hey, see you Wednesday night in prayer meeting. That, that would turn some heads. As a matter of fact, uh, that would probably be far from the minds of many. But in the early church, when you became a believer, you were added to the flock. You joined with them. You came together. And they came together very purposely and steadfastly. The word there, steadfast, means to adhere to firmly, strongly. Guerrilla tape. To be glued to one another. To cling to one another. That's the thought here. And as they came together and clung to one another, they continued in the teaching. We talked about that. They continued in the preaching. We talked about that. They continued in communion. We talked about that. And in fellowship, communion, and in prayer. We get down the road just a little way and we find again the church is occupied with prayer right from the beginning. During the persecution, during Peter's arrest and imprisonment, while he's in prison, while he's in prison, the believers again continue to pray and to pray for Peter and that's just what they do. Look at that with me for just a minute. Acts chapter 12. Turn there just a minute if you would. Don't be afraid to get your hands active in the Bible. And our, and our Wednesday night studies, even Sunday, I, I really, uh, and I know I, I'm, I'm getting used to just touching on my iPad and getting into the Bible that way. And I, I do that regularly. But there's something refreshing about opening up the Bible and doing a little homework. Chapter 12, and this is the, the, the account of Peter being arrested by Herod, that he might kill him and get more praise from the people. Amazing what a politician will do to gain advancement, praise of the people, favor. And uh, I'll, I'll jump right into it here. Verse 5, it says, Peter therefore was kept in prison by Herod. Notice what it says, but prayer was made without ceasing by the church unto God for Peter. It was so good last Sunday. Trust you had a chance to watch it online if you weren't here. It was so good last Sunday to have Eric and Lori Brown with us uh, for the morning. We had the chance to spend uh, the afternoon having lunch with them. And um, just a great, great opportunity. A uh, great day for it. We were able to eat outside and, and relax and enjoy each other's fellowship. Uh, but but prayer was made by the church. Are we really praying today? Uh, we sent out an email this morning. Some of our folks were in need of prayer. We ought to be a praying church. Why? Because that's what the church does. Whether we come together or whether we're together and being apart, the church comes together in the matter of prayer. Now many today have gathered together for prayer even though we've not been in a church building together. Now this situation 
they did come together and they were praying together. There's a place for what we call corporate prayer, church prayer. That's one of the things the church does when they come together. What should a Sunday morning worship service look like? There should be reading the scripture. There should be preaching the scripture. There should be public prayer. Why do we have reading of the scripture? Why do we have prayer in the morning? Why do we have time of preaching? Because it's the example, the exhortation that we find given to us in the Word of God. To do anything else would be a disclaimer of our responsibility. It would be a derelict of duty, as the Scripture puts it. And so we find here, uh, as Peter goes back to the house, the, the, the angel lets Peter loose, <laughs> and he goes to the house where the prayer meeting is being held. By the way, he knew where the saints would be, and he knew what they'd be doing, and he knocks on the door, and, and they're in there busy praying. Wasn't it a good seeing Eric and Lori? Did you get a chance to pray for them before they came? To enjoy them, to encourage them? They're encouragers for us. But how we ought to be encouraging one another, not only for our missionaries, but for one another in the church. So great is the need. I've had more refreshing opportunities to talk with our church family and to hear what God is doing now in some of our some of your lives and, and that's encouraging. It's encouraging because even though we're not gathering as we had beforehand, the Word of God isn't being belittled. It's not being set aside completely. Maybe some, yes. But others are discovering it and desiring it. And they're getting into God's Word. I have some folks that are not saved that I've been praying for for a very, very long time that even in these past two to three weeks has shown interest like I've not seen beforehand. Don't minimize the day we're in. Even the, the election and all the process and the ups and downs and upside downs of it. Friends, don't let that discourage you. God has us here for this time for His purpose. And we want to accomplish that as His people. Even in the midst of the pandemic. And we're not the only ones. We know it's across our country and across our world. But the church is to rise up and represent the Lord Jesus and deliver the message of hope in a day when it is so desperately needed. Truth, so desperately needed. And uh, you and I have the privilege of doing that. Well, come back with me, if you would, to that uh, section we're looking at in Acts 2. I got hung up here just because the Holy Spirit really just drove this point in. I, I wasn't bringing us here initially, but as we're talking about the importance of fellowship, uh, I couldn't escape, uh, couldn't escape this here. In chapter 2, 43, uh, 42, they continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread, that's communion, and in prayers. And drop down here, if you would, verse 44, the, the, the miracles are being done by the Apostles. And it says in verse 44, this is the phrase that gripped me. And all that believed were together. Our togetherness can be done physically, yes, as a church family. But beyond that, our togetherness is it's in the heavenly realm. It's in the spiritual realm as well. Although we may not be in each other's presence today, we are still together as God's people. There's no such thing as an untogether. Christian, a disjointed Christian in that sense. No one can isolate themselves from the relationship, mutual relationship that we have together. As a matter of fact, look at verse, uh, verse 44. Interesting. All that believed were together. Yes, there. The sense is that they were together physically, right? They were together physically. And that's the underlying statement. That, that's the emphasis of the study. God calls us to come together physically. Now, the scripture knows nothing of people who say, yes, I'm a Christian, but I just have nothing to do with the church. That does not fit with the teaching of scripture. 
that is not good doctrine. It's not biblical thinking. And truly, it has nothing out of the Word of God in that sense. You cannot rightly say, God's made me a Christian, but I'm a solo Christian. I'm a lone ranger. And you choose to do that. And that's what I'm talking about. I realize beyond choice, some cannot be in fellowship practically, physically. At it, 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 such times as this maybe, or other times in their lives, particularly again, we'll remember those that aren't able to get out any longer. They are homebound or in a home or away. But notice the language here at the end of the verse. And they had all things common. Now you and I that know the chapter a little bit understand that means that everyone's needs were met. That's what Christians do. We make sure that one another's needs are met. You, you support one another, you support the church. Then the church families to support you and to care for you along the journey as well. Sometimes we'll all have need in that way. That's what the scripture teaches. But that word common is far, it extends far more than just meaning uh, we shared a, a car or we shared a meal or we shared some money with someone or we sold land and, and, and gave it to the church to put it in the offering uh, to be used uh, as the deacons would allow it to be used, uh, choose for it to be used. That word common is the same word we found up in verse 42. Same root word, that is, and it's the word fellowship. I kind of went, went over it initially. It's the word fellowship. They had all things in fellowship. That meant this, they, they shared them, they had them in common. When we come together, there's a commonness about our coming together. We come to church together as God's people, there's a commonness. What's the common denominator, would you say, when the church gathers? What's the common no denominator between us? Christ? Uh, music, maybe? Uh, pray, praise for God, that is. Uh, God's Word? Is that not a common denominator? Yes, I would agree with all of those things. One more. It's you. It's me. It's him. It's her. It's them over there and those over there. It's us, and that's the sense that we have it used up in verse 42, they continued in fellowship. The, the, there the indication was they continued in being in common fellowship with one another. I want to look at that with you a second. I'll not ask you to turn there. I'm going to 1 John chapter 1, a, a wonderful portion here. Uh, you no doubt are familiar with it. And uh, John is, the Apostle John is in his later years and he's writing about this commonness, this union. Or, by the way, this word common is also the root word in the word communion. And the commonness is here in verse 3. When, when, when the apostles declared Jesus Christ as being their Savior, their head, that which we have seen and heard concerning Christ, declare we unto you, John writes, that you also may have commonness with us, fellowship with us. The commonness for the Christian, it extends to one another. We are members one of another. It, it goes beyond that. It's not limited to you and I, because truly that flows out of a greater commonness, and this verse wraps it all up, that you may have fellowship, commonness with us, and truly our fellowship, our, our mutual oneness, unity. Our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Two weeks ago, in the dwell reading, the theme verse for the week down at the end ended with this phrase. It talked about the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. I remember looking at that and saying, I wonder what that really is getting at. And when I get to this part of the study, I understood what God was saying to me. 
the Holy Spirit is in us. When I see you, when you see me, when I serve you as you serve me, as we serve God together, as we sing together, pray, and, and, and hear the Word of God together, friends, we have commonness. Commonness that is in Christ. It's, we are united in Him. We are joined together in Him. In our oneness, our integrity of fellowship, we are individuals. But there's no individual Christians. We are placed into the body of Christ. Mutually, 1 Corinthians 12 teaches us we are members one of another. We desperately need one another. We need to see each other. I like to hear and get received texts from one another. I was just running into Hannaford's uh, uh, a few minutes uh, coming out, and I saw one of our uh, folks uh, tonight on the way out. How I enjoyed that time there. Uh, and I could go on and on about that, but I think it's important. Uh, scripture doesn't minimize. Yes, we're, we're all in this together, as the world likes to say. Spiritually speaking, we're all in this together. But in Acts 1, we, uh, we realize very, very clearly that this does not exclude our individual, uh, what we pour into it, how much we put into the ministry individually. And, and, and one of the things that really uh, uh, troubles my heart as your pastor uh, in these days is this, that there, there are some of us, we've not seen each other in a long time, it's been months. And, and, and what troubles a pastor's heart in a time like this is that because we can't be with each other and shake one another's hands or give a hug as we normally could, that, that some of the church family would feel isolated from others, from the pastor, from the church leaders, from one another. And in that isolation, come to believe that somehow they don't make a difference anyway. And that would be Satan's work to make us think that. When I turn back in my study back to chapter 1 of Acts, I find the Holy Spirit is very instructive to us about what's happening in this matter of uh, Christians coming together, God's people. You know, chapter 1 of Acts is when the disciples had been with Jesus, and then Jesus uh, ascended to the Father. He went right up into the heavens before their very eyes, and uh, up to heaven he went, and he, he de they declared uh, he'd come again, as the same manner he went up into the heaven, he'd, he'd come back in the heavens again. But that being said, the disciples were left in Jerusalem, and the Lord told them to wait for the Holy Spirit to come, the promise of the Father. Verse 14 in chapter 1, it names, verse 13 names the disciples particularly, name, names them one by one, and says, verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer. And that they were together. And it says not only do they continue prayer and supplication with the women, with the women in last mention of Jesus' mother Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. So here we have a, a great number. As a matter of fact, uh, Peter's there. It says in verse 15, and the number of names together were about 120. Now it doesn't list all 120, but Scripture affirms not only the number, but the names of some. What does that teach us? It teaches us that God knows our names as well as the numbers of how many people. We probably uh, had about 30 people here on Sunday. We probably had room for another 15 people uh, to join us. And if we get too many, we could go to doing two services, whatever it might be. And, um, uh, but, but, but God knows us. He knows where we are. And if there's anything that's true about the family of God that God has put together here in this church, it's this. 
that God doesn't take any of his children, lift them out, set them out like a coal uh, off the hot fire. He doesn't take that coal out and set it outside in a cold place on its own. God will never do that to his people. As a matter of fact, when he, when he speaks to us, the Holy Spirit stirs us up and warms us up. And he brings us into that atmosphere of fellowship. First of all, the commonness with the Holy Spirit. We communion with him, with the Father and with the Son. And yes, indeed, our identity with one another. So that we look more like what's behind me. Not only on a Sunday, but every day. The Christian ought to be connecting. And there are so many opportunities for that today, aren't there? For you and I? To fellowship together? Chapter 2, verse 1. When did the Holy Spirit come and crown wonderfully all the children of God in that time? The church? Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had finally arrived fully come. They, the disciples, the believers, were all in one accord in one place. That was by divine appointment, by the way. And you and I may not all be together tonight in one room, in one place. But I want to leave your heart with that lingering thought tonight, if I might. A little slow down on the study, but I think it's important that you and I learn to understand and appreciate the work of God, not only in our own lives, but in our lives. And God has placed me, and He's placed you, and the rest of the church family together in Him. And He's placed the Holy Spirit in us. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he's, he's, God has placed us into, baptized us into the Holy Spirit. What's that about? It means this, no one, no one becomes a part of the family of God without coming to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit residing in, moving in, and dwelling them. And friends, no matter where you are tonight, the Holy Spirit, Christian, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit resides in you and like a magnet. He will draw you to the other members of the family because that's what He does. I trust He encourages you that way this week that even if you haven't been here physically, it's been a while, please pray about it. Become active. Because that fellowship, it isn't only a doctrinal word. Paul thanks the believers in Philippi for their fellowship in the gospel. That, that word mean, means their active participation. And as we've had uh, communication through emails, as we've had our services, as we've had support, the church soon will get a new facelift out here. And that takes many, many believers behind the scenes working together to fellowship, to actively participate in the ministry. And if you've been out there and feeling alone, friends, connect with us. Get connected. Connect with someone else. Most important, may we have fellowship with the Father, with His Son, and communion with the Holy Spirit. Pray that will encourage your heart. It's been encouragement to me. And I'm just uh, lifted up over this and, and thinking about the fact that, Lord, you're bigger than all of this. But one thing for sure, we're all a part of what you're doing. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thanking you again for this privilege of coming together for our midweek Bible study, thinking about these things that, Lord, are challenging to my heart, challenge, challenging to all of our hearts. Lord, I pray that we'd understand the visible and the invisible attachment that we have, first of all, to Jesus Christ, because we're in Him, to God the Father who put it all together, to the Holy Spirit who you placed inside of us. And Lord, may, may the work of the Godhead in us, Lord, work through us, that we might be 
the very kind of people, the church, you'd have us to be. May we be a preaching church, a teaching church, a church that communes, prays together, fellowships in your most holy name. Lord, we thank you for all of these things. In your most holy name we ask these things tonight. Amen and amen. Well, have a good rest of the week. Enjoy it, because it's still fall for a little while yet. <laughs> God bless. Bye-bye.